Chapter 4. Independence. On the 2nd of July, 1775, after a journey of 11 days, General Washington arrived in Cambridge from Philadelphia, and on the following day, under the shade of the great elm tree which still stands hard by the common, he took command of the Continental Army, which as yet was composed entirely of New Englanders. Of the 16,000 men engaged in the siege of Boston, Massachusetts furnished 11,500, Connecticut 2,300, New Hampshire 1,200, Rhode Island 1,000. These contingents were arrayed under their local commanders and under the local flags of their respective commonwealths, though our team at Ward of Massachusetts had by courtesy exercised the chief command until the arrival of Washington. During the month of July, Congress gave a more continental complexion to the army by sending a reinforcement of 3,000 men from Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia including the famous Daniel Morgan, with his sturdy band of sharpshooters each man of whom, it was said, while marching at double quick, could cleave with his rifle ball a squirrel at a distance of 300 yards. The summer of 1775 thus brought together in Cambridge many officers whose names were soon to become household words throughout the length and breadth of the land and a moment may be fitly spent in introducing them before we proceed with the narrative of events. Daniel Morgan, who had just arrived from Virginia with his rifleman, was a native of New Jersey, of Welsh descent. Moving to Virginia at an early age, he had won a great reputation for bravery and readiness of resource in the wild campaigns of the Seven Years' War. He was a man of gigantic stature and strength, and incredible powers of endurance. In his youth, it is said, he had received five hundred lashes by order of a tyrannical British officer, and had come away alive and defiant. On another occasion, in a fierce woodland fight with the Indians, in which nearly all his comrades were slain, Morgan was shot through the neck by a musket ball. Almost fainting from the wound, which he believed to be fatal, Morgan was resolved, nevertheless, not to leave his scalp in the hands of a dirty Indian, and falling forward, with his arms tightly clasped about the neck of his stalwart horse, though mists were gathering before his eyes, he spurred away through the forest paths, until his foremost Indian pursuer, unable to come up with him, hurled his tomahawk after him with a yell of baffled rage, and gave up the chase. With this unconquerable tenacity, Morgan was a man of gentle and unselfish nature, a genuine diamond, though a rough one, uneducated, but clear and strong in intelligence and faithful in every fibre. At Cambridge began his long comradeship with a very different character. Benedict Arnold, a young man of romantic and generous impulses, and for personal bravery unsurpassed, but vain and self-seeking, and lacking in moral robustness, in some respects a more polished man than Morgan, but of a nature at once coarser and weaker. We shall see these two men associated in some of the most brilliant achievements of the war, and we shall see them persecuted and insulted by political enemies until the weaker nature sinks and is ruined, while the stronger endures to the end. Along with Morgan and Arnold there might have been seen on Cambridge Common a man who was destined to play no less conspicuous a part in the great campaign which was to end in the first decisive overthrow of the British. For native shrewdness, rough simplicity, and dauntless courage, John Stark was much like Morgan. What the one name was in the great woods of the Virginia frontier, that was the other among the rugged hills of northern New England, a symbol of patriotism and a guarantee of victory. Great as was Stark's personal following in New Hampshire, he had not, however, the chief command of the troops of that colony. The commander of the New Hampshire contingent was John Sullivan, a wealthy lawyer of Durham who had sat in the First Continental Congress. 
Sullivan was a gentleman of culture and fair ability as a statesman. As a general, he was brave, intelligent, and faithful, but in no wise brilliant. Closely associated with Sullivan for the next three years we shall find Nathan Nail Green, now in command of the Rhode Island contingent. For intellectual caliber all the other officers here mentioned are dwarfed in comparison with Green, who comes out at the end of the war with a military reputation scarcely, if at all, inferior to that of Washington. Nor was Green less notable for the sweetness and purity of his character than for the scope of his intelligence. He had that rare genius which readily assimilates all kinds of knowledge through an inborn correctness of method. Whatever he touched, it was with a master hand, and his weight of sense soon won general recognition. Such a man was not unnaturally an eager book buyer, and in this way he had some time ago been brought into pleasant relations with the genial and intelligent Henry Knox, who from his bookshop in Boston had come to join the army as a colonel of artillery and soon became one of Washington's most trusty followers. Of this group of officers, none have as yet reached very high rank in the Continental Army. Sullivan and Green stand at the end of the list of brigadier generals, the rest are colonels. The senior major general, R.T. Mertz Ward, and the senior brigadiers, Beaumaroy Heath, Thomas, Wooster, and Spencer, will presently pass into the background, to make way for these younger or more vigorous men. Major General Israel Putnam, the picturesque wolf slayer, a brave and sterling patriot, but of slender military capacity, will remain in the foreground for another year, and will then become relegated mainly to garrison duty. With the exception of Morgan, all the officers here noticed the New England men, as is natural, since the seat of war is in Massachusetts, and an army really continental in complexion is still to be formed. The southern colonies have as yet contributed only Morgan and the commander-in-chief. New York is represented in the Continental Army by two of the noblest of American heroes, Major General Phillips Chawala and Brigadier General Richard Montgomery, but these able men are now watching over Ticonderoga and the Indian frontier of New York. But among the group which in 1775 met for consultation on Cambridge Common, or in the noble Tory mansion now hallowed alike by memories of Washington and of Longfellow, there were yet two other generals, closely associated with each other for a time in ephemeral reputation won by false pretenses, and afterwards in lasting ignominy. It is with pleasure that one recalls the fact that these men were not Americans, though both possessed estates in Virginia. It is with regret that one is forced to own them as Englishmen. Of Horatio Gates and his career of imbecility and intrigue, we shall by and by see more than enough. At this time he was present in Cambridge as Adjutant General of the Army. But his friend, Charles Lee, was for the moment a far more conspicuous personage, and this eccentric creature, whose career was for a long time one of the difficult problems in American history, needs something more than a passing word of introduction. Although Major General Charles Lee happened to have acquired an estate in Virginia, he had nothing in common with the illustrious family of Virginian Lees beyond the accidental identity of name. He was born in England, and had risen in the British Army to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He had served in America in the Seven Years' War, and afterward, as a soldier of fortune, he had wandered about Europe, obtaining at one time a place on the staff of the King of Poland. A restless adventurer, he had come over again to America as soon as he saw that a war was brewing here. There is nothing to show that he cared a rush for the Americans, or for the cause in which they were fighting but he sought the opportunity of making a name for himself. He was received with enthusiasm by the Americans. His loud, pompous manner and enormous self-confidence at first imposed upon everybody. He was tall, lank, and hollow-cheeked, 
with a discontented expression of face. In dress he was extremely slovenly. He was fond of dogs, and always had three or four at his heels, but toward men and women his demeanor was morose and insulting. He had a sharp, cynical wit, and was always making severe remarks in a harsh, rough voice. But the trustful American imagination endowed this unpleasant person with the qualities of a great soldier. His reputation was part of the unconscious tribute which the provincial mind of our countrymen was long wont to pay to the men and things of Europe, and for some time his worst actions found a lenient interpretation as the mere eccentricities of a wayward genius. He had hoped to be made commander-in-chief of the army, and had already begun to nourish a bitter grudge against Washington, by whom he regarded himself as supplanted. In the following year we shall see him endeavoring to thwart the plans of Washington at the most critical moment of the war, but for the present he showed no signs of insincerity, except perhaps in an undue readiness to parley with the British commanders. As soon as it became clear that a war was beginning, the hope of winning glory by effecting an accommodation with the enemy offered a dangerous temptation to men of weak virtue in eminent positions. In October, 1775, the American camp was thrown into great consternation by the discovery that Dr. Benjamin Church, one of the most conspicuous of the Boston leaders, had engaged in a secret correspondence with the enemy. Dr. Church was thrown into jail, but as the evidence of treasonable intent was not absolutely complete, he was set free in the following spring and allowed to visit the West Indies for his health. The ship in which he sailed was never heard from again. This kind of temptation, to which Church succumbed at the first outbreak of the war, beset Lee with fatal effect after the Declaration of Independence, and wrought the ruin of Arnold after the conclusion of the French alliance. To such a man as Charles Lee, destitute of faith in the loftier human virtues or in the strength of political ideas, it might easily have seemed that more was to be hoped from negotiation than from an attempt to resist Great Britain with such an army as that of which he now came to command the left wing. It was fortunate that the British generals were ignorant of the real state of things. Among the moral effects of the Battle of Bunker Hill there was one which proved for the moment to be of inestimable value. It impressed upon General Howe, who now succeeded to the chief command, the feeling that the Americans were more formidable than had been supposed, and that much care and forethought would be required for a successful attack upon them. In a man of his easy-going disposition, such a feeling was enough to prevent decisive action. It served to keep the British force idle in Boston for months and was thus of great service to the American cause. For in spite of the zeal and valor it had shown, this army of New England Minute Men was by no means in a fit condition for carrying on such an arduous enterprise as the Siege of Boston. When Washington took command of the army on Cambridge Common, he found that the first and most trying task before him was out of this excellent but very raw material to create an army upon which he could depend. The Battle of Bunker Hill had just been lost, under circumstances which were calculated to cheer the Americans and make them hopeful of the future, but it would not do to risk another battle, with an untrained staff and a scant supply of powder. All the work of organizing an army was still to be done, and the circumstances were not such as to make it an easy work. It was not merely that the men, who were much better trained in the discipline of the town meeting than in that of the camp, needed to be taught the all-important lesson of military subordination, it was at first a serious question how they were to be kept together at all. That the enthusiasm kindled on the day of Lexington should have sufficed to bring together 16,000 men, and to keep them for three months at their posts, was already remarkable, but no army, however patriotic and self-sacrificing, can be supported on enthusiasm alone. The army of which Washington took command was a motley crowd, 
clad in every variety of rustic attire, armed with trusty muskets and rifles, as their recent exploit had shown, but destitute of almost everything else that belongs to a soldier's outfit. From the common down to the river, their rude tents were dotted about here and there, some made of sailcloth stretched over poles, some piled up of stones and turf, some oddly wrought of twisted green boughs, while the more fortunate ones found comparatively luxurious quarters in Massachusetts Hall, or in the little Episcopal Church, or in the houses of patriotic citizens. These volunteers had enlisted for various periods, for the most part short, under various contracts with various town or provincial governments. It was not altogether clear how they were going to be paid, nor was it easy to see how they were going to be fed. That this army should have been already subsisted for three months without any commissariat was in itself an extraordinary fact. Day by day the heavy carts had rumbled into Cambridge, bringing from the highlands of Berkshire and Worcester, and from the Merrimack and Connecticut valleys, whatever could in any wise be spared of food, or clothing, or medicines, for the Patriot Army, and the pleasant fields of Cambridge were a busy scene of kindness and sympathy. Penn made all possible haste, and arrived in London on the 14th of August but when he got there the king would neither see him nor receive the petition in any way, directly or indirectly. The Congress was an illegal assembly which had no business to send letters to him, if any one of the colonies wanted to make terms for itself separately, he might be willing to listen to it. But this idea of a united America was something unknown either to law or to reason, something that could not be too summarily frowned down. The king issues a proclamation, and tries to hire troops from Russia so while Penn waited about London, the king issued a proclamation, setting forth that many of his subjects in the colonies were in open and armed rebellion, and calling upon all loyal subjects of the realm to assist in bringing to condign punishment the authors and abettors of this foul treason. Having launched this thunderbolt, George sent at once to Russia to see if he could hire 20,000 men to aid in giving it effect, for the loyal subjects of the realm were slow in coming forward. A war against the Americans was not yet popular in England. Lord Chatham withdrew his eldest son, Lord Pitt, from the army, lest he should be called upon to serve against the men who were defending the common liberties of Englishmen. There was, moreover, in England as well as in America, a distrust of regular armies. Recruiting was difficult, and conscription was something that the people would not endure unless England should actually be threatened with invasion. The king had already been obliged to raise a force of his Hanoverian subjects to garrison Minorca and Gibraltar thus setting free the British defenders of these strongholds for service in America. He had no further resource except in hiring troops from abroad. Catherine refuses but his attempt in Russia was not successful, for the Empress Catherine, with all her faults, was not disposed to sell the blood of her subjects. She improved the occasion as sovereigns and others will sometimes do by asking George, sarcastically, if he thought it quite compatible with his dignity to employ foreign troops against his own subjects as for Russian soldiers, she had none to spare for such a purpose. The king hires German troops foiled in this quarter, the king applied to the Duke of Brunswick, the Landgrave of Hefskassel, the Princes of Uldeck and Anhaled Zerbst, the Margrave of Anspach Beiruth, and the Count of Hessenai and succeeded in making a bargain for 20,000 of the finest infantry in Europe, with four good generals, Wright D. Searle of Brunswick, and Nefausen, Van Hester, and Don Ope of Hess. The hiring of these troops was bitterly condemned by Lord John Cavendish in the House of Commons, and by Lords Camden and Shelburne and the Duke of Richmond in the House of Lords and Chatham's indignant invectives at a somewhat later date are familiar to everyone. It is proper, 
However, that in such an affair as this we should take care to affix our blame in the right place. The king might well argue that in carrying on a war for what the majority of Parliament regarded as a righteous object, it was no worse for him to hire men than to buy cannon and ships. The German troops, on their part, might justly complain of Lord Camden for stigmatizing them as mercenaries, inasmuch as they did not come to America for pay, but because there was no help for it. It was indeed with a heavy heart that these honest men took up their arms to go beyond sea and fight for a cause in which they felt no sort of interest, and great was the mourning over their departure. The persons who really deserved to bear the odium of this transaction were the mercenary princes who thus shamelessly sold their subjects into slavery. It was a striking instance of the demoralization which had been wrought among the petty courts of Germany in the last days of the old empire, and among the German people it excited profound indignation. Indignation in Germany the popular feeling was well expressed by Schiller in his Cabal und Lieb. Frederick the Great in a letter to Voltaire declared himself beyond measure disgusted, and by way of thriftily expressing his contempt for the transaction he gave orders to his custom house officers that upon all such of these soldiers as should pass through Prussian territory a toll should be levied, as upon cattle exported for foreign shambles. Burning of Portland, Oct. 16. 1775 when the American question was brought up in the autumn session of Parliament, it was treated in the manner with which the Americans had by this time become familiar. A few far-sighted men still urged the reasonableness of the American claims, but there was now a great majority against them. In spite of grave warning voices, both houses decided to support the King and in this they were upheld by the University of Oxford, which a century ago had burned the works of John Milton as blasphemous, and which now, with equal felicity, in a formal address to the King, described the Americans as a people who had forfeited their lives and their fortunes to the justice of the state. At the same time the Department of American Affairs was taken from the amiable Lord Dartmouth, and given to the truculent Lord George Germain. These things were done in November, 1775, and in the preceding month they had been heralded by an act of wanton barbarity on the part of a British naval officer, albeit an unwarranted act, which the British government as promptly as possible disowned. On the 16th of October, Captain Mowat had sailed with four small vessels into the harbour of Portland then called Falmouth and with shells and grenades set fire to the little town. St. Paul S. Church all the public buildings and three-fourths of all the dwellings were burned to the ground and a thousand unoffending men, women and children were thus turned out of doors just as the sharp main winter was coming on to starve and freeze them. The news of the burning of Portland reached Philadelphia on the same day, October 31, with the news that George III was about to send foreign mercenaries to fight against his American subjects, and now the wrath of Congress was thoroughly kindled, and the party which advised further temporizing was thrown into helpless minority. Well, brother rebel, said a southern member to Samuel Ward of Rhode Island, we have now got a sufficient answer to our petition, I want nothing more, but am ready to declare ourselves independent. Congress now advised New Hampshire, Virginia and South Carolina to frame for themselves new Republican governments as Massachusetts had already done. It urged South Carolina to cease the British vessels in her waters, it appointed a committee to correspond with foreign powers, and above all, it adopted unreservedly the scheme, already partially carried into operation, for the expulsion of the British from Canada. At once upon the outbreak of hostilities at Lexington, the conquest of Canada had been contemplated by the northern leaders, who well remembered how, in days gone by, 
the valley of the St. Lawrence had furnished the base for attacks upon the province of New York, which was then the strategic center of the American world. It was deemed an act of military prudence to secure this region at the outset. But so long as the least hope of conciliation remained, Congress was unwilling to adopt any measures save such as were purely defensive in character. As we have seen, it was only with reluctance that it had sanctioned the garrisoning of Ticonderoga by the Connecticut troops. But in the course of the summer it was learned that the Governor of Canada, Sir Guy Carleton, was about to take steps to recover Ticonderoga and it was credibly reported that intrigues were going on with the Iroquois tribes to induce them to harry the New England frontier and the pleasant farms on the Hudson, so that, under these circumstances, the invasion of Canada was now authorized by Congress as a measure of self-defense. An expedition down Lake Champlain, against Montreal, was at once set on foot. As Chawala, the commander of the Northern Department, was disabled by ill health, the enterprise was confided to Richard Montgomery, an officer who had served with distinction under Wolfe. Late in August, Montgomery started from Ticonderoga and on 12 September, with a force of 2,000 men, he laid siege to the fortress of St. John's, which commanded the approach to Montreal. Carleton, whose utmost exertions could bring together only some 900 men, made heroic but fruitless efforts to stop his progress. After a siege of 50 days, St. John's surrendered on the 3rd of November, and on the 12th Montgomery entered Montreal in triumph. The people of Canada had thus far seemed favorably disposed toward the American invaders and Montgomery issued a proclamation urging them to lose no time in choosing delegates to attend the Continental Congress. Meanwhile, in September, Washington had detached from the army at Cambridge 1,000 New England infantry, with two companies of Pennsylvania riflemen and Morgan's famous Virginia sharpshooters, and ordered them to advance upon Quebec through the forests of Maine and by way of the rivers Kennebec and Chaudy. The expedition was commanded by Colonel Benedict Arnold, who seems to have been one of the first, if not the first, to suggest it. Such plans of invading an enemy's territory, involving the march of independent forces upon convergent lines from remote points, were much more in favor with military men a century ago than today. The vice of such methods was often illustrated during our Revolutionary War. The vast distances and total lack of communication made effective cooperation between Montgomery and Donald impossible while a surprise of Quebec by the latter, with force sufficient to capture it unaided, was almost equally out of the question. But the very difficulty of the scheme commended it to the romantic and buoyant temper of Benedict Arnold. The enterprise was one to call for all his persistent daring and fertile resource. It was an amphibious journey, as his men now rowed their boats with difficulty against the strong, swift current of the Kennebec, and now, carrying boats and doors on their shoulders, forced their way through the tangled undergrowth of the primeval forests. Often they had to wade across perilous bogs, and presently their shoes were cut to pieces by sharp stones, and their clothes torn to shreds by thorns and briars. Their food gave out, and though some small game was shot, their hunger became such that they devoured their dogs. When they reached the head of the Chaudi, after this terrible march of thirty-three days, two hundred of their number had succumbed to starvation, cold, and fatigue, while two hundred more had given out and returned to Massachusetts, carrying with them such of the sick and disabled as they could save. The descent of the Chaudier in their boats afforded some chance for rest, and presently they began to find cattle for food. At last, on the 13th of November, the next day after Montgomery's capture of Montreal, 
They crossed the broad St. Lawrence and climbed the heights of Abraham at the very place where Wolf had climbed to victory 16 years ago. There was splendid bravado Imanolds advancing to the very gates with his little, worn-out army, now reduced to 700 men, and summoning the garrison either to come out and fight, or to surrender the town. But the garrison very properly would neither surrender nor fight. The town had been warned in time, and Arnold had no alternative but to wait for Montgomery to join him. Six days afterward, Carleton, disguised as a farmer, and ferried downstream in a little boat, found his way into Quebec, and on the 3rd of December, Montgomery made his appearance with a small force, which raised the number of the Americans to 1,200 men. As Carleton persistently refused to come out of his defenses, it was resolved to carry the works by storm, a chivalrous, nay, one might almost say, a foolhardy decision, had it not been so nearly justified by the event. On the last day of 1775, England came within an ace of losing Quebec. At two o'clock in the morning, in a blinding snowstorm, Montgomery and Arnold began each a furious attack, at opposite sides of the town and aided by the surprise, each came near carrying his point. Montgomery had almost forced his way in when he fell dead pierced by three bullets, and this so chilled the enthusiasm of his men that they flagged, until reinforcements drove them back. Arnold, on his side, was severely wounded and carried from the field, but the indomitable Morgan took his place, and his Virginia company stormed the battery opposed to them and fought their way far into the town. Had the attack on the other side been kept up with equal vigor, as it might have been but for Montgomery's death, Quebec must have fallen. As it was, Morgan's triumphant advance only served to isolate him and presently he and his gallant company were surrounded and captured. With the failure of this desperate attack passed away the golden opportunity for taking the Citadel of Canada. Arnold remained throughout the winter in the neighborhood of Quebec, and in the spring the enterprise was taken up by Wooster and Sullivan with fresh forces. But by this time many Hessians had come over, and Carleton, reinforced until his army numbered 13,000, was enabled to recapture Montreal and push back the Americans, until in June, after a hazardous retreat, well conducted by Sullivan, the remnant of their invading army found shelter at Crown Point. Such was the disastrous ending of a campaign which at the outset had promised a brilliant success, and which is deservedly famous for the heroism and skill with which it was conducted. The generalship of Montgomery received the warm approval of no less a critic than Frederick the Great, and the chivalrous bravery of Arnold both in his march through the wilderness and in the military operations which followed, was such that if a kind fate could then and there have cut the thread of his life, he would have left behind him a sweet and shining memory. As for the attempt to bring Canada into the American Union, it was one which had no hope of success save through a strong display of military force. The sixteen years which had elapsed since the victory of Wolfe had not transformed the Canadian of the old regime into a free-born Englishman. The question at present for him was only that of a choice of allegiance, and while at first the invaders were favorably received, it soon became apparent that between the Catholic and the Puritan there could be but little real sympathy. The Quebec Act, which legalized Catholic worship in Canada, had done much toward securing England's hold upon this part of her American possessions. And although, in the colorless political condition of this northern province, the capture of Quebec might well have brought it into the American Union, where it would gradually have taken on a fresh life as surely as it has done under British guidance, yet nothing short of such a military occupation could have had any effect in determining its languid preferences. While Canada was thus freed from the presence of the Continental troops, the British Army, 
on the other hand, was driven from Boston, and New England was cleared of the enemy. During the autumn and winter, Washington had drawn his lines as closely as possible about the town, while engaged in the work of organizing and equipping his army. The hardest task was to collect a sufficient quantity of powder and ball and to bring together siege guns. As the season wore on, the country grew impatient, and Washington sometimes had to listen to criticisms like those that were directed against McClellan in Virginia, at the beginning of 1862, or against Grant before Vicksburg, in the spring of 1863. President Hancock who owned a great deal of property in Boston, urged him to set fire to the town and destroy it, if by so doing he could drive the British to their ships. But Washington had planned much more wisely. By the 1st of March a great quantity of cannon had been brought in by Henry Knox, some of them dragged on sledges all the way from Ticonderoga, and so at last Washington felt himself prepared to seize upon Dorchester Heights. This position commanded the town and harbor even more effectually than Bunker Hill, and why in all these months General Howe had not occupied it one would find it hard to say. He was bitterly attacked for his remissness by the British newspapers, as was quite natural. Washington chose for his decisive movement the night of the 4th of March. 800 men led the way, escorting the wagons laden with spades and crowbars, hatchets, hammers, and nails, and after them followed 1,200 men, with 300 ox carts, carrying timbers and bales of hay, while the rear was brought up by the heavy siege guns. From Somerville, East Cambridge, and Roxbury, a furious cannonade was begun soon after sunset and kept up through the night, completely absorbing the attention of the British, who kept up a lively fire in return. The roar of the cannon drowned every other sound for miles around, while all night long the 2,000 Americans, having done their short march in perfect secrecy were busily digging and building on Dorchester Heights and dragging their siege guns into position. Early next morning, Howe saw with astonishment what had been done, and began to realize his perilous situation. The commander of the fleet sent word that unless the Americans could be forthwith dislodged, he could not venture to keep his ships in the harbor. Most of the day was consumed in deciding what should be done, until at last Lord Percy was told to take 3,000 men and storm the works. But the slaughter of Bunker Hill had taught its lesson so well that neither Percy nor his men had any stomach for such an enterprise. A violent storm, coming up toward nightfall, persuaded them to delay the attack till next day, and by that time it had become apparent to all that the American works, continually growing, had become impregnable. Pursuers orders were accordingly countermanded and it was decided to abandon the town immediately. It was the sixth anniversary of the day on which Hutchinson had yielded to the demand of the town meeting and withdrawn the two British regiments from Boston. The work then begun was now consummated by Washington, and from that time forth the deliverance of Massachusetts was complete. How caused it at once to be known among the citizens that he was about to evacuate Boston, but he threatened to lay the town in ashes if his troops should be fired on. The selectmen conveyed due information of all this to Washington, who accordingly secured in the achievement of his purpose allowed the enemy to depart in peace. By the 17th, the 8,000 troops were all on board their ships, and taking with them all the Tory citizens, some 900 in number, they sailed away for Halifax. Their space did not permit them to carry away their heavy arms, and their retreat, slow as it was, bore marks of hurry and confusion. In taking possession of the town, Washington captured more than 200 serviceable cannon, ten times more powder and ball than his army had ever seen before, and an immense quantity of muskets, gun carriages, and military stores of every sort. 
Thus was New England set free by a single brilliant stroke with very slight injury to private property and with a total loss of not more than twenty lives. The time was now fairly ripe for the colonies to declare themselves independent of Great Britain. The idea of a separation from the mother country, which in the autumn had found but few supporters, grew in favour day by day through the winter and spring. The incongruousness of the present situation was typified by the flag that Washington flung to the breeze on New Year's Day at Cambridge, which was made up of thirteen stripes, to represent the United Colonies, but retained the British crosses in the corner. Thus far, said Benjamin Harrison, they had contrived to hobble along under a fatal attachment to Great Britain, but the time had come when one must consider the welfare of one's own country first of all. As Samuel Adams said, their petitions had not been heard, and yet had been answered by armies and fleets, and by myrmidons hired from abroad. Nothing had made a greater impression upon the American people than this hiring of German troops. It went farther than any other single cause to ripen their minds for the Declaration of Independence. Many now began to agree with the Massachusetts statesmen, and while public opinion was in this malleable condition, there appeared a pamphlet which wrought a prodigious effect upon the people, mainly because it gave terse and vigorous expression to views which everyone had already more than half formed for himself. Thomas Paine had come over to America in December, 1774, and through the favor of Franklin had secured employment as editor of the Pennsylvania Magazine. He was by nature a dissenter and a revolutionist to the marrow of his bones. Full of the generous though often blind enthusiasm of the 18th century for the rights of man, he was no respecter of the established order whether in church or state. To him the church and its doctrines meant slavish superstition, and the state meant tyranny. Of crude undisciplined mind, and little scholarship, yet endowed with native acuteness and sagacity, and with no mean power of expressing himself, Paint succeeded in making everybody read what he wrote, and achieved a popular reputation out of all proportion to his real merit. Among devout American families his name was for a long time a name of horror and opprobrium, and uneducated freethinkers still build lecture halls in honor of his memory, and celebrate the anniversary of his birthday, with speeches full of harmless but rather dismal platitudes. The Age of Reason, which was the cause of all this blessing and banning, contains, amid much crude argument, some sound and sensible criticism such as is often far exceeded in boldness in the books and sermons of Unitarian and Episcopalian divines of the present day, but its tone is coarse and dull, and with the improvement of popular education, it is fast sinking into oblivion. There are times, however, when such caustic pamphleteers as Thomas Paine have their uses. They are times when they can bring about results which are not so easily achieved by men of finer mould and more subtle intelligence. It was at just such a time, in January, 1776, that Paine published his pamphlet, Common Sense, on the suggestion of Benjamin Rush and with the approval of Franklin and of Samuel Adams. The pamphlet contains some irrelevant abuse of the English people, and resorts to such arguments as the denial of the English origin of the Americans. Not one-third of the people, even of Pennsylvania, are of English descent, argues Paine, as if Pennsylvania had been preeminent among the colonies for its English blood, and not, as in reality, one of the least English of all the thirteen. But along with all this there was a sensible and striking statement of the practical state of the case between Great Britain and the colonies. The reasons were shrewdly and vividly set forth for looking upon reconciliation as hopeless, and for seizing the present moment to declare to the world what the logic of events was already fast making an accomplished fact. Only thus, it was urged, 
Could the states of America pursue a coherent and well-defined policy, and preserve their dignity in the eyes of the world? It was difficult for the printers with the clumsy presses of that day, to bring out copies of common sense fast enough to meet the demand for it. More than a hundred thousand copies were speedily sold, and it carried conviction wherever it went. At the same time, Parliament did its best to reinforce the argument by passing an act to close all American ports and authorize the confiscation of all American ships and cargoes, as well as of such neutral vessels as might dare to trade with this proscribed people. And, as if this were not quite enough, a clause was added by which British commanders on the high seas were directed to impress the crews of such American ships as they might meet, and to compel them under penalty of death, to enter the service against their fellow countrymen. In reply to this edict, Congress, in March, ordered the ports of America to be thrown open to all nations, it issued letters of marquee, and it advised all the colonies to disarm such Tories as should refuse to contribute to the common defence. These measures, as Franklin said, were virtually a declaration of war against Great Britain. But before taking the last irrevocable step, the prudent Congress waited for instructions from every one of the colonies. The first colony to take decisive action in behalf of independence was North Carolina a commonwealth in which the king had supposed the outlook to be especially favorable for the Loyalist party. Recovered in some measure from the turbulence of its earlier days, North Carolina was fast becoming a prosperous community of small planters, and its population had increased so rapidly that it now ranked fourth among the colonies, immediately after Pennsylvania. Since the overthrow of the pretender at Culloden there had been a great immigration of sturdy Scots from the West and Highlands, in which the clans of MacDonald and MacLeod were especially represented. The celebrated Flora MacDonald herself, the romantic woman who saved Charles Edward in 1746, had lately come over here and settled at Kingsborough with Alan MacDonald, her husband. These Scottish immigrants also helped to colonize the upland regions of South Carolina and Georgia, and they have considerably affected the race composition of the southern people, forming an ancestry of which their descendants may well be proud. Though these highland clansmen had taken part in the Stuart insurrection, they had become loyal enough to the government of George III and it was now hoped that with their aid the colony might be firmly secured, and its neighbours on either side overawed. To this end, in January, Sir Henry Clinton, taking with him 2,000 troops, left Boston and sailed for the Cape Fear River, while a force of seven regiments and ten ships of war, under Sir Peter Parker, was ordered from Ireland to cooperate with him. At the same time, Josiah Martin, the royal governor, who for safety had retired on board a British ship, carried on negotiations with the Highlanders until a force of 1,600 men was raised and, under command of Donald MacDonald, marched down toward the coast to welcome the arrival of Clinton. But North Carolina had its Minutemen as well as Massachusetts and no sooner was this movement perceived than Colonel Richard Caswell with 1,000 militia, took up a strong position at the bridge over Moores Creek, which MacDonald was about to pass on his way to the coast. After a sharp fight of a half-hour's duration the Scots were seized with panic, and were utterly routed. 900 prisoners, 2,000 stand of arms, and 15,000 pounds in gold were the trophies of Caswell's victory. The Scottish commander and his kinsman, the husband of Flora MacDonald, were taken and lodged in jail, and thus ended the sway of George III. Over North Carolina. The effect of the victory was as contagious as that of Lexington had been in New England. Within ten days ten thousand militia were ready to withstand the enemy, so that Clinton, on his arrival, decided not to land 
and stayed cruising about Old Mile Sound, waiting for the fleet under Parker, which did not appear on the scene until May. A provincial congress was forthwith assembled, and instructions were sent to the North Carolina delegates in the Continental Congress, empowering them to concur with the delegates in the other colonies in declaring independency and forming foreign alliances, reserving to the colony the sole and exclusive right of forming a constitution and laws for it. At the same time that these things were taking place, the colony of South Carolina was framing for itself a new government, and on the 23rd of March, without directly alluding to independence, it empowered its delegates to concur in any measure which might be deemed essential to the welfare of America. In Georgia the Provincial Congress, in choosing a new set of delegates to Philadelphia, authorized them to join in any measure which they might think calculated for the common good. In Virginia the party in favor of independence had been in the minority, until, in November, 1775, the royal governor, Lord Dunmore, had issued a proclamation, offering freedom to all such Negroes and indented white servants as might enlist for the purpose of reducing the colony to a proper sense of its duty. This measure Lord Dunmore hoped would oblige the rebels to disperse, in order to take care of their families and property. But the object was not attained. The relations between master and slave in Virginia were so pleasant that the offer of freedom fell upon dull, uninterested ears. With light work and generous fare, the condition of the Virginia Negro was a happy one. The time had not yet come when he was liable to be torn from wife and children, to die of hardship in the cotton fields and rice swamps of the far south. He was proud of his connection with his master's estate and family, and had nothing to gain by rebellion. As for the indented white servants, the governor's proposal to them was of about as much consequence as a proclamation of Napoleon's would have been if, in 1805, he had offered to set free the prisoners in Newgate on condition of their helping him to invade England. But impotent as this measure of Lord Dunmer's was, it served to enrage the people of Virginia, setting their minds irretrievably against the king and his cause. During the month of November, hearing that a party of rebels were on their way from North Carolina to take possession of Norfolk, Lord Dunmore built a rude fort at the Great Bridge over Elizabeth River, which commanded the southern approach to the town. At that time, Norfolk, with about 9,000 inhabitants, was the principal town in Virginia, and the commercial center of the colony. The Loyalist Party, represented chiefly by Scottish merchants, was so strong there and so violent that many of the native Virginia families, finding it uncomfortable to stay in their homes, had gone away into the country. The Patriots, roused to anger by Dunmert's proclamation, now resolved to capture Norfolk, and a party of sharpshooters, with whom the illustrious John Marshall served as lieutenant, occupied the bank of Elizabeth River, opposite Dunmert's fort. On the 9th of December, after a sharp fight of 15 minutes in which Dunmer's regulars lost 61 men, while not a single Virginian was slain, the fort was hastily abandoned, and the road to Norfolk was laid open for the Patriots. A few days later the Virginians took possession of their town, while Dunmore sought refuge in the Liverpool, ship of the line, which had just sailed into the harbour. On New Year's Day the governor vindictively set fire to the town, which he had been unable to hold against its rightful owners. The conflagration, kindled by shells from the harbour, raged for three days and nights until the whole town was laid in ashes, and the people were driven to seek such sorry shelter as might save them from the frosts of midwinter. This event went far toward determining the attitude of Virginia. In November the colony had not felt ready to comply with the recommendation of Congress, and frame for herself a new government. 
the people were not yet ready to sever the links which bound them to Great Britain. But bombardment of their principal town was an argument of which everyone could appreciate the force and the meaning. During the winter and spring the revolutionary feeling waxed in strength daily. On the 6th of May, 1776, a convention was chosen to consider the question of independence. Misson, Henry, Pendleton, and the illustrious Madison took part in the discussion, and on the 14th it was unanimously voted to instruct the Virginia delegates in Congress to propose to that respectable body to declare the United Colonies free and independent states, and to give the assent of the colony to measures to form foreign alliances and a confederation, provided the power of forming government for the internal regulations of each colony be left to the colonial legislatures. At the same time, it was voted that the people of Virginia should establish a new government for their commonwealth. In the evening, when these decisions had been made known to the people of Williamsburg, their exaltation knew no bounds. While the air was musical with the ringing of church bells, guns were fired, the British flag was hauled down at the State House, and the crosses and stripes hoisted in its place. This decisive movement of the largest of the colonies was hailed throughout the country with eager delight, and from other colonies which had not yet committed themselves responses came quickly. Rhode Island, which had never parted with its original charter, did not need to form a new government, but it had already, on the 4th of May, omitted the king's name from its public documents and sheriff's writs and had agreed to concur with any measures which Congress might see fit to adopt regarding the relations between England and America. In the course of the month of May town meetings were held throughout Massachusetts and it was everywhere unanimously voted to uphold Congress in the Declaration of Independence which it was now expected to make. Thus, after eleven years of irritation, and after such temperate discussion as befitted the free people, the Americans had at last entered upon the only course that could preserve their self-respect, and guarantee them in the great part which they had to play in the drama of civilization. For the dignity, patience and moderation with which they had borne themselves throughout these trying times, history had as yet scarcely afforded a parallel. So extreme had been their forbearance, so great their unwillingness to appeal to brute force while there yet remained the slightest hope of a peaceful solution, that some British historians have gone quite astray in interpreting their conduct. Because statesmen like Dickinson and communities like Maryland were slow in believing that the right moment for a declaration of independence had come, the preposterous theory has been suggested that the American Revolution was the work of an unscrupulous and desperate minority, which, through intrigue mingled with violence, succeeded in forcing the reluctant majority to sanction its measures. Such a misconception has its root in an utter failure to comprehend the peculiar character of American political life, like the kindred misconception which ascribes the rebellion of the colonies to a sordid unwillingness to bear their due share of the expenses of the British Empire. It is like the misunderstanding which saw an angry mob in every town meeting of the people of Boston, and characterized as a riot every deliberate expression of public opinion. No one who is familiar with the essential features of American political life can for a moment suppose that the Declaration of Independence was brought about by any less weighty force than the settled conviction of the people that the priceless treasure of self-government could be preserved by no other means. It was but slowly that this unwelcome conviction grew upon the people, and owing to local differences of circumstances it grew more slowly in some places than in others. Prescient leaders, too, like the Adamses and Franklin and Lee, made up their minds sooner than other people. 
even those conservatives who resisted to the last, even such men as John Dickinson and Robert Morris, were fully agreed with their opponents as to the principle at issue between Great Britain and America, and nothing would have satisfied them short of the total abandonment by Great Britain of her pretensions to impose taxes and revoke charters. Upon this fundamental point there was very little difference of opinion in America. As to the related question of independence, the decision, when once reached, was everywhere alike the reasonable result of free and open discussion, and the best possible illustration of this is the fact that not even in the darkest days of the war already begun did any state deliberately propose to reconsider its action in the matter. The hand once put to the plough, there was no turning back. As Judge Drayton of South Carolina said from the bench, a decree is now gone forth not to be recalled, and thus has suddenly risen in the world a new empire, styled the United States of America.